All right, so we have one more panel left, right? And this is one of the great title. Today's workforce, tomorrow's challenges. And I'm gonna say as a business owner, I got a lot of today's challenges, but that's okay. Um, all right, my talking points. It's been a long, challenging road for businesses to find the right employees and to keep them. I can't tell you, every time I talk to a CEO, it's attraction and retention, attraction and retention. Nothing that you guys don't know, and our panel is gonna help you out here. Um, the relationships between employers and employers have changed dramatically due to COVID. We all know why, we're all trying to adjust. And look, we're trying to adjust as supervisors and we're trying to, to adjust as employees, it's all good. That's why we brought our next panel in here. They're gonna share some of the policies, programs, and relationships, activities that have helped attract and retain talent around it. So now I'm gonna invite them out on the stage and join us for our moderation, which is gonna come from the Executive Director and Head of Workforce Global Philanthropy at J.P. Morgan Chase, which sounds pretty cool, Monique Batiste. Welcome, Monique, and panel. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. All right, let's dive right in. All right, good afternoon everyone. Thank you all for sticking around for this panel. Uh, we're really gonna have this as a conversation. Um, this is a topic that is very front of mind for us, uh, and so we were gonna have this conversation with or without you. Um, but it is an absolute pleasure to be here. So panel, let's dive right in. Yeah. All right, great. So, you know, Tom started us off with some, you know, high level talking points, right? We don't have to, you know, revisit the fact that, you know, this is a very different labor market than it was as recently as two years ago, right? We're, we're all looking for talent. There's, I was at a, an event very recently that had uh, a myth versus reality. And the myth was that there's a war on talent. Uh, and the comparative reality was there is no war because talent won. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's the reality that, that we're in today and we all have to change and pivot in order to make sure that we're finding the talent that we need and, and more importantly that we're re retaining that talent as well to, to get the job done. So let's dive right into the conversation. Um, so what I will do is our panelists, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself uh, at the top of the questions, just tell us a little bit about your role, your business, uh, how you come at this issue of talent. Um, and then what we'll do is, you know, we'll, we'll keep running through the conversation and then we'll wrap at the end with a Q&A that Tom will facilitate and we'll wrap for the day, all right? So Tara, let's start with you. Um, the topic of the day right now is about hybrid work, right? How we work, where we work, when we work. And we know our employees, their, our, our, their mindsets have shifted as a result of COVID and how we've all had to adapt. So tell us a little bit about how you're looking at that space and some of the considerations that, that employees are, are having from your, from your perspective. Thank you, Monique, and thank you for allowing me to be the voice of the small business owner today. I'm Tara Daldell of the Tara Daldell Group, and we are a social good marketing and PR agency, and we're located in Jersey City. Uh, I am from, though, North Brunswick, New Jersey, so Middlesex County. Woo -woo. Uh, and uh, we, we work, we are full service, so we provide public relations, branding, messaging, copywriting, web design, graphic design, so video work now we've added to our, our, uh, our tools and arsenal. And, and so for me, I have to start with the employee, right? I have to start with the team because we're a service business. So by definition, our talent is the most important part of the business. So if I can't get that right, then nothing else works for me. So as my mother always said, uh, necessity is the mother of all invention. So for me, it was uh, a challenge, certainly switching to hybrid, but I had to look at it from an opportunity perspective, right? And so as a small business owner, I have to look at almost everything from an opportunity perspective. So when we pivoted to being first completely remote, and we're still pretty much remote, even though we maintain our office, for me, it was about how do I now ensure that our processes work for the remote and hybrid environment. So that was a bigger consideration for me because I feel as if, if, you, if you give your team, 
if you have the number one, if you have the right team, and if you give your team a voice in the process, then you will come out on the other side all right. So what I did was we looked at our processes, but we looked at our processes as a team. So obviously I have the luxury of being small, there's eight of us, so I had the luxury of, of really having my team be full stakeholders, and that's something I know we're gonna talk about. But I looked to my team and we made the decisions together of how we wanted to function in this new environment. And so I think that was something that really gave us an advantage. And I think people, I think folks rise to the occasion, right? When, when, when they have to, they really truly rise to the occasion, especially if they have ownership. And so it was about, again, starting with the people, centering my team, giving them ownership and a stake in the decision making, and then building processes collectively with them. That's great, that's great. I would love to turn it to you, Sarah, to tell us a little bit about your vantage point from EY yeah. and what does the world of work look like now? Yeah, thanks for having me as well. Um, I'm Sarah Grau, I uh, work at Ernst & Young, uh, we call it EY. I'm based in the Island, New Jersey office. Um, I've been at EY about 22 years and I um, am focused heavily on the employee experience, talent engagement, and uh, I work on a number of projects, including regulatory and compliance. And re most recently, actually, um, I had um, the, the good fortune of working on developing our way of working model, which was really our approach to hybrid working. So it's really interesting, Tara, that you mentioned um, allowing your um, employees to have a voice in how they're going to work, and that really was kind of underpinned our EY way of working. We call it EY Wow. And um, that, that model is really centered around working two to three days a week um, in person, whether it's at a client or in person together, but allowing team members to come together, discuss and decide where they're going to work, coming together for moments that matter. So we probably were coming together pre-pandemic five days a week, and we probably didn't need to be together five days a week. But now we have the option or the opportunity to have a little bit of flexibility in our lives, a little bit of balance, and then also come together for just those moments that matter. So it's deciding as a team what really makes sense, when do we need to be together, specifically for our audit business, when are there key audit areas that we really need to be together in person or at the client building those relationships. Great, great. And, and Maria, I would love your take on this new world of work. Sure, um, I'm Maria Sadlowski. I'm the Vice President of Human Resources at MTF Biologics. Uh, we ex aseptically process bone and tissue. It's used for transplant and research. Um, I've been with MTF a little over 20 years, so excited, thank you for having me here. Um, for us, our workforce never had the opportunity to be remote. Um, prior to that. So uh, we're considered healthcare, so we have technicians that are there and they're aseptically processing bone and tissue and it's used for sports medicine injuries and things of that nature. So during the pandemic, half of our workforce had to be on site. There was no, you, you couldn't, we wouldn't be able to run the business. So, um, but for everyone else, all the supporting um, roles, we all went hybrid. So for us, that was a little bit of a challenge because it, we weren't used to that. So we had to really pivot quickly and our IT department was great getting people the equipment that they needed, setting up our ability to do Teams meetings. Um, and we kind of, HR put together some roadmaps for the different managers and the different departments for them to follow, but we didn't hold them to that. It really has to be what's going to work for your group because what works for my group may not work for the quality group or may not work for the finance group or, or marketing or whatever it may be. So um, we just took a step back and we wanted to see how it was gonna how it was gonna come turn around and so we're doing great um, people love it and they're following it so that that's perfect um, so we didn't have to come back and say all right you know what you're not logging on and now you have to be back in the office I think they just love the ability to balance work and life a little bit better by being home a few days a week so they're really um, on when they need to be on and always available that's great I mean it's it's 
really great to hear comparatively that how, as firms, you all have adapted uh, and really responded to the times and held over what worked, right, into your everyday practice. So, so that's fantastic to hear. So let's dig in a little bit on retention is one issue, attraction is another issue, right? We are dealing with one of the tightest labor markets of record, right? We're talking, you know, three, four percent uh, un or unemployment rate, which is insane, right? <laughs> to, from a recruiting perspective, um, we're talking, you know, a talent pool that is a very mixed bag of, you know, knowledge workers as well as uh, individuals who are skills based, right? That don't necessarily have a bachelor's degree or don't necessarily have a degree, but have strong skills to advance our business objectives. And so I would love to hear from each of you, how are you approaching talent acquisition? How are you approaching really finding the right talent for the jobs that you have? Maybe we'll, we'll start off with you, Sarah. Yeah, sure. So um, we, we hire, the majority of the people that we hire are about 85% off campus. So we have campus hiring and experienced hiring. About 85% are into our audit business. And we have a number of programs. It's, it's really hard attracting folks to the accounting industry. We've seen a huge dip. In, um, in the attraction in the accounting industry, which is really unfortunate because there's always jobs. <laughs> so so uh, we have to get a little creative, but um, we'll get into you know, what EY offers in terms of you know, really generous and competitive pay and all of the things that we offer in a little bit. But just in terms of on campus, just some of the programs that we offer um, specifically to attract some of, um, to attract DEI professionals, uh, we have a launch internship where we approach professionals or students who are in their sophomore year who spend two years internship with us in, in, as an intern and they get to try out different parts of the business. We have a really great conversion rate um, to, those, uh, to those interns. We also have a program called our Digital Ambassador Program. So once um, folks come in as interns, we allow them, about 100 to 200 a year, allow them to work on a business challenge. It's really allowing them to be upskilled in BI and Alteryx, or Alteryx, I think I said it right. Um, and they, they take on a business challenge and then they present it to a panel. And we have about a 95% conversion rate with those interns because they're so challenged and they're really um, engaged in our business and they have great visibility to our leaders. Um, we also have, um, for, we hire folks um, coming on with 150 credits. So people who are students who are, have 120 credits, who still need those extra 20 to 30 credits if they don't have AP courses, um, we've partnered with the Holt, um, Holt Business School and um, we, for um, a subsidize, um, we, we provide um, funding for those individuals to get those extra credits and they can be an intern um, with us and then be in school as well as get their master's degree um, it running concurrent to when, um, to as they're doing their college courses. So that has been a huge draw for us. We've had, we have about 150 every year that we sponsor for that program and um, we've had a great response to it. So those are just a couple of the things that we're trying to do to attract people back into the industry and back to EY to kind of distinguish ourselves in the market. Excellent. Tara, I would love for you to jump in. So as I mentioned earlier, the, we're very people-centered and by definition, we have to be. So one of the things that I think that, I, I will say this in all candor, I've gotten a lot of things wrong in business. I've made a lot of mistakes. But one of the things that I've gotten right is the retention. And, and so what I think I try to do is first, for our business, as I mentioned, we're social good. So we lead with our values. And if you look at the data, a lot of younger workers, a lot of folks coming out of college, they really want to work places where they feel that the employer has a set of values that align with theirs, and not just for the customers, but those values have to be internal as well. And I think that's somehow sometimes where the disconnect occurs is that a company will do all this wonderful philanthropic work, but those values aren't happening internally. And younger folks are very clear about what they want, and they're very clear about hypocrisy. Mm -hmm. And they will call you out, or they'll simply choose not to work with you. So, we, so I work really, really hard to ensure that what 
our values are and what we communicate to the public, our values are for our clients, that those are replicated internally. And so some of the things that I do are not all, there certainly we have processes, employee handbook, we have programs, we have all of that. But it starts at the top. Culture starts at the top. And so one thing, I, I was talking to my team about this because the other day a member of my team actually said this to me. She said, you're too hard on yourself because I own it. If I make a mistake, I own it. And I own it publicly because I want the team to know that they need to own it and step up and take responsibility and find the solution. So I think it starts with ensuring that, that the leadership has a set of values and that those values are communicated across all managers because as I mentioned, my, a lot of my employees are younger, so they come and they tell me about what they hear is happening at their roommate's job. And so I listen and I take those things into consideration and I, and I, I police myself and say, I wanna make sure I'm not doing these dysfunctional behaviors because we're all human, right? We're gonna make mistakes, right? We're gonna do things that aren't right or aren't good sometimes. It's just the nature of the beast. And so I tell the team, I'm gonna make mistakes. You're gonna make mistakes. And, and, and that's okay. What we say to the client is, we, I messed up, I dropped the ball, here's the solution. And so that's another thing, of a set of values that we have at the business, is it's about being solution oriented. If there's conflict between two people, what's the solution? Don't come to me, and this is, a, this is a policy that I've said, don't come to me and tell me this went wrong or that went wrong. Mm -hmm. Lead with the solution because that'll keep you focused on doing what needs to happen to fix the problem, but also being a better person. And so that's one of the things that we really enforce. And so the other uh, pieces of it from sort of the practical and policy and programmatic standpoint is we did an exit interview recently with someone who left. She left after she started with us at, in college, um, came right at the college and worked uh, and left after seven years, which I'm really proud of uh, for a small business. The level of retention we have is really, I think, impressive. And so we asked her some of the things that she liked and, and was there anything we could have done differently? And she actually did a complete career change, so there was nothing we could have done differently. But what she said was the flexibility. So one thing we have is sort of an informal, um, it's memorialized in our handbook, but it's somewhat informal too, actually, is our employees, they're able to, even though we are remote and we, ma we maintain our office and we are remote, but we're a marketing firm, so we're out there, we're at events, we're doing things, we're taking clients to interviews, and so it can get very busy. So people need time to go to the doctor. They need time to, to, to go pick up their dry cleaning. They're just a life, right? Life happens. So we have sort of a, a rule that you can sort of dictate yourself when you're gonna do that. Just make sure it's at the top of the day before the workday starts, lunchtime or later in the day, and you just have to put it on the calendar and it can't happen around a major client event. Right. And so people comply with that. That is one of the single biggest perks that my team has identified is that no one's telling them, because we all know, try to get an appointment with your primary care doctor, right? Like, you, you want to take what you can get, right? And so that, that simple adjustment mm -hmm. is one of the things that our team values the most. And I said our team, because I think our Vice President, Justina, she did a panel earlier, I think she's in the audience, I really can't see, um, <laughs> but I think she might be in the audience. And, and so that's the other thing. And then I think the last thing, because now I'm talking too much, which is um, self-awareness. <laughs> uh, but the other thing uh, is, is in, in addition to the flexibility, is we also are always looking at how we can do things better. So we're launching a mentoring program. We don't have enough people. The big PR marketing firms have their leadership, their mentors. We don't have enough people to do that. So we've ident we're identifying mentors outside of our space to mentor each of us, including me and uh, around our, our areas and, and what people want to improve upon. And it's not just limited to professional development. It's, li it's also personal development. Some people said they want to do mentorship around well-being and how to better take care of themselves. So just innovating and coming up with ideas and listening to the employees and letting them sort of guide that. So one member of my team is kind of leading the effort of helping to shape with me this mentoring program. That's fantastic. And, and so I think, you know, 
Sarah, you, you mentioned, you know, really digging into the talent pipeline and making those those education connections to really create a pipeline of talent to that can become full time for the firm. Right. You were mentioning leading with values, leading with culture, having culture as a really key driver, not just for that talent attraction, right? Because the streets talk, right? Right, right. <laughs> but also for that retention uh, long term, so that people really feel vested in the company, and so. I would love Maria, you know, you're representing, you know, one of the top places to work here in New Jersey. So you sound like you have some secrets to share. <laughs> wow. So I would love to get a sense of what your talent acquisition ideas are. Sure. So I guess I don't know if it's a secret. Um, we were, we're just so super lucky. Our turnover is less than 12%. Um, and prior to the pandemic, it was less than 10%. Um, so we're just lucky in that respect. Uh, we're a not-for-profit, so a lot of people think that the money's not there. I'm going to go work for this biomedical place, and they're not going to pay me anything because they're not-for-profit. But our money's there for base salary, and we do do the bonus. What we're lacking, however, is long-term incentives because we're not-for-profit. So therefore, what we have to do is really look at our benefits package, and I'm not just talking medical, dental, and vision, I'm talking about like everything else, adoption assistance, um, oh, I, like tuition reimbursement, we pay 100% of books and tuition, so we really had to beef up like those things, so we have, um, somebody come and pick up dry cleaning, take it, comes back the next day. Um, some of the other things we do is we have, through Delta Dental, we have the dentist come on site so people can get their routine cleanings during the day. Um, doctor, same thing. Flu shot, same thing. Everybody, like, we just bring everybody that we can on site um, so that they're not taking time away from their families or their loved ones at the end of the day or the beginning of the day, we allow them time to do it during the day. So that helps us and we continually look at that. And then the second part that really helped us is this hybrid work. So one of the great things for us was this, because we have a call center in, in Colorado and it's really difficult to hire in Colorado. It's just very, very difficult. But now with the pandemic, we were able to close that facility save money on rent and all of that, and now we have everyone doing it from their home offices. So we have been able to hire people, and we just hired somebody in Hawaii, North Dakota, Pennsylvania, like we're all, we're just all over the place now. So that was really great for us, as well as um, when we did see some people resigning, ironically enough, it was um, engineers, and they were in that sweet spot, that three to five year, you know, mechanical process, quality engineer role, and they were getting jobs at the big organizations and they were allowed to work from home. So now with hybrid, we can allow that as well. So that has helped us, that, that has helped us tremendously too. So those are just a yeah, couple of things. You, you touched on something in that, right, which is just the burnout right, that workers are feeling right now across every industry. There, there's, I don't think there's an industry that was spared. Obviously, there are some that had it as more of an acute challenge than others, but I don't think anyone was spared. So would love to turn to you, Sarah, and get your thoughts on how are you all solving for that burnout issue, right? How are you really thinking mm -hmm. about the well-being and approaching the well-being of your employees? Well, if anyone is out there who solved it, I, we'd love to know <laughs> your <laughs> secret. <laughs> what we're trying to do is just baby steps, is really just understand what our people want and where, what's the root cause of it? And a lot of it is around communication. Um, we talked about hybrid working and uh, coming together as a team. When are we going to be remote and when are we going to be working together? But really making well-being just part of the fabric of our very business and being. So what we've done at EY is we've appointed a chief well-being officer. And this individual is actually a partner. So he's an owner of our business. So we are serious about well-being. And this, this chief well-being officer has a team below him and we've rolled out a couple of initiatives um, called Fit to Perform, a well-being toolkit, so that our teams can really take a toolkit um, on, on their teams together and work through various milestones that are related to well-being, whether it's 
creating boundaries, disconnecting, um, shutting down computers, shutting off teams, we use Microsoft Teams, making sure that that's off at the end of the day. Coming together as a team and deciding, okay, at 7 p.m., we are shutting you know, teams down and you shut it off of your, your phone and you no longer have it, you know, doesn't pop up on your phone so it's not bothering you during, during dinner. Uh, we also have a well-being fund, um, so each employee is uh, allocated $1,000 to um, focus on just anything well-being, and that could be vacations, it could be a, a ski trip, it could be sneakers, it could be towards a Peloton. Everybody, it, it's just another piece that tells our employees that we are focused on your well-being. We also are very focused on mental health. So we know burnout, there's a huge association. So it's mental health and burnout is a huge, it's, a, it's an epidemic. And um, we have really upped our mental health offering. So we have, we use Lyra and each employee plus immediate family members in the household are allocated uh, 25 sessions, up to 25 sessions to speak with a counselor to focus on their, on their mental um, health and well-being. And it doesn't mean that you have to um, be in a crisis to talk to somebody. It could be, you know what, I'm having a really rough day, I'm having a really rough time on my team, I'm having financial trouble, I, I want to talk to somebody. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be that you're in crisis. So we want to normalize the fact that mental health is a, everybody, everybody experiences it at different levels. And so there are different levels of Lyra that are sort of, I just wanna to talk to somebody, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not feeling great, I'm kind of in the middle and I'm in crisis. So there are different levels for sure. Um, we also have, um, our executives also have signed off on a well-being goal. So they are required to reinforce well-being on their teams and they are measured on that by their counselors and they are impacted in their performance. Um, as well as financially, if they do not meet um, those goals, if they are driving people away. And we have measures that can, that can help tell us who those people are. So we're really serious about well-being. Yeah, I mean, that's great. I mean, I think, you know, just being able to codify it and really hold folks accountable for the yes. well-being of their employees is so, such an important part of this. And so I would love, Tara, to actually switch it over to you. You know, I think what Sarah has highlighted, right, is the idea of employees as a really, really critical stakeholder, right, to our businesses, right, regardless of what our businesses are, regardless of the size of our businesses. And so would love to get your thoughts representing small business. I would love to get your thoughts on how you really see employees as full stakeholders to your firm and, and the work that you do. So, so. I'm probably a, 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 an extreme example of seeing the employees as, as full stakeholders. We'll take it. Yeah. Uh, and, and so one of the things that we do as a service business offering the marketing services that we offer is uh, the employee, the team is often very involved in whether or not we take a client on, a new client on, because uh, I, I learned very early on in business that you can't take every client and some clients will cost you a lot more than they will ever make you. Mm -hmm. and. And so, and I've had some toxic clients, right? And so having the team play a role in who we want to take on, because it's, again, if we're, we're saying that we're a social good marketing and PR agency and our work is about promoting mission-driven businesses and government and healthcare and all of those industries that are about social good, then we have to make sure that we're aligned with that in our client choices, right? And so, so the, the team often plays a role in, in, in helping to determine whether or not we're going to, uh, to proceed with a, certain, with a certain client. And I think that's something else that they really benefit from and appreciate. And frankly, we all have blind spots and, and I'm big on self-awareness and I know I have blind spots and sometimes they actually catch something uh, that I didn't see. And I've dodged a bullet before um, as a result of their uh, sort of picking up on something or, or just uh, in, in the case of some of my team members, I think they could be private detectives or FBI profilers. <laughs> <laughs> and so they'll do a deep dive and be like, oh my God, I found this online about this particular client. Um, Google so, is dangerous. Yeah, yeah exactly, dangerous. exactly. Never so. forgets. <laughs> so I think that's, um, that's something that we do. Obviously, people have to make the choices that work for their businesses, but for our business, that's something that the employees like, the, te the team likes, and it also benefits our business. And it also ensures that when they perform for those clients, right, that 
their performance is reflective of the fact that they had a role in, 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 in vetting and ensuring that um, this was the right fit for us. So I think that's one example. Uh, and then also, again, back to the ownership. So we use what's called the Scrum model. Mm -hmm. I don't know if folks have read the book Scrum. If you haven't, I highly recommend uh, the book Scrum. And the author's name is escaping, right, escaping me right now. So the way we're set up is kind of like the way ICU in the hospital works, where the ICU physician will round, but there's a nutritionist, there's a, uh, there's a, a respiratory therapist, and there's fellows, right? That, that sort of is the, is the model. So our teams are kind of cross-functional for clients. And what we find with a cross-functional team versus like, accounting, marketing, what we found for our business is that, and this is what the book says, you can catch things early on if you have different disciplines working together because the lead, well in our case, this wouldn't apply because we don't have, I'm the legal department, but in, in the scrum <laughs> book it talks about how you'll start a project, you'll get almost through the project and then the legal department will say it can't function this way you can't do it so now you scrap the project right you have to start over so when you have cross-functional teams folks will catch things that they would wouldn't automatically come to them as early in the process because they'd be part of a siloed separate team and so that's something we found to be extremely helpful to our business the team likes it because they like leaning on the expertise of the other function areas it really cuts down on siloing which is um, a problem it cuts down on teams kind of competing. So we find it really offers, uh, and it offers us the ability to be more efficient. We're, I could say we're small but mighty, and I think we're mightier because of this cross-functional approach that we, we, uh, we provide. And I think the last thing I would say that I think has been a really competitive advantage for us, because although we're small, we actually compete against really large PR and marketing agencies, so we have to punch above our weight because that's who we're competing against in the marketplace. And so our team is very good about, and we've cultivated this environment where if you need help, go to your teammate and say, hey, I'm slammed today, can you, can you take this? And so we found that, that that letting people have the freedom to sort of decide amongst themselves how they're gonna help each other has been something that's been extraordinarily helpful for us in our, um, in our work. I appreciate that, because I, I think what you're highlighting is a pivot in the way you do business, right? A, a pivot in the approach and the practice that really puts a new way of working in front of our employees to really help them be collaborative and create collaborative spaces. And I think what that triggers for me is a question about the way we work. So I'm gonna ask all three of you to pull out your crystal balls, right? do a little forecasting, which is a terrible question to ask coming off of a pandemic, because <laughs> you know, who knows, right? Um, but I would love your thoughts, each of your thoughts on where do you see the world of work, our workforce, talent, where do you see it going five years from now? I know that's a really unfair question, but I would really, shoot the moon, I would love to hear your thoughts on where do you see the talent landscape going? Let's start with wow. you. Um, well, I have this argument with our CFO all the time because he is insistent that within the next six months, everybody, there is going to be no more hybrid work. And I'm like, oh, I don't know about that. I think it's here to stay. I'm going to bet against him on that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to bet against him on that one too. Yeah, yeah. So um, I think for us, I think you're going to see more, actually, the whole entire world, actually, you're going to see this hybrid work model. And it's here. To, I feel like it's here to stay. And I think it's going to help so many businesses with their ability to attract and retain talent if they do offer it. Um, yeah, I mean, and but you, you know what? Your business has to be like spot on with technology because if you're not, it's not going to work. Um, definitely not going to work if you're not spot on with technology. And you need to be able to have those lines of communication open because, um, as Tara said, the communication is the key. Um, and if you don't have that and there's a breakdown in that, then your whole business is going to fail. Yeah, so yeah, definitely that communication. It makes a ton of sense, Sarah. Yeah, I think at EY we're trying to understand what does this current generation and workforce want? Mm -hmm. And why do people leave organizations? And we, we know people leave for better pay, but that's short-sighted and it's short-term. So we know what we're seeing is that people want 
different career experiences. They want to have different disciplines. So Terry, you mentioned, you know, some of your employees have different disciplines. That's exactly what we're doing at EY as well. We are we are creating a model with our audit professionals that they can be multidisciplinary. They don't have to just know audit. They can do rotations, because that's what they want. They want to do rotations. They want diverse experiences. They want to get more technical here. Um, or maybe they just want to try something out, but maybe they decide they want to go back to where they were. So I think that um, a serious focus on well-being and flexibility and continuing to push that. I think hybrid working is here to stay. I completely uh, agree with you there um, and disagree with the folks at <laughs> your organization. Your CFO is losing this one. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I'm, going really... back. I'm going back today to tell him that. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, and, and competitive pay, I mean, we're just going to continue to have to pay people, you know, at um, b above market because we're losing them above market. whether. We know what's better for them or not. It's making sure that bonuses are really rich and healthy and thoughtful um, for our highest performers and, um, and those diverse career experiences as well because that's why we see people leave. That's great. I mean, I, I see Tom is about to give us the hook, so, 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 so yeah. Tara, I'm going to give you the, the last word on this before Tom Tom's joins giving us. me the evil eye. <laughs> so Crystal Ball, where do, you see, where do you see the world of work going? I think so. I think that there is going to be a diminishing of grind culture, and I am 100% guilty of. I'm the one that takes the calls on the weekends from clients. I'm at night thinking about work. I, that's something I've not gotten right in my own well-being, and um, I, I've done a good job for the team. I'm not, I've not done a great job for myself. I do think, though, that there's going to be a diminishing of grind culture. I think there's a start, already starting to be a pushback against it, uh, a more boundary setting. I think, folks, you're, you're seeing companies establishing more generous paid leave for both parents of all genders, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that that's uh, going to be, there's going to be just a, a continuing increased emphasis on what Sarah pointed out of employee well-being, mental health, and making sure because honestly, I think that probably our days don't have to be as long. I think we're probably not as productive as we could be. And I think we're not as productive because we're stressed mm -hmm. and we're dealing with all kinds of issues. And so I think when you, when we focus more on well-being, you eliminate those distractions and then you're probably more productive anyway. Right. So I think that that's, I think we're gonna realize that and I think that's gonna become a bigger part of our culture. I don't know how long it's gonna fully take, but I think the, the seeds are already being planted and I think we're all realizing, I think the pandemic really changed a lot of our perspectives, uh, I, I would say for the better. Whether we all see it or not yet, I think it's changed our perspectives for the better and helped us to sort of recenter mm -hmm. what's important in our lives. Sure. And I think that will reflect throughout the workplace. Yeah. Fantastic. So true. This has been a phenomenal conversation, ladies. So thank you for your insights and your wisdom. Tom, I'll throw it over to you. So we're going to take questions if you have them. I got a couple. I'm going to start with my friend Tara, who I've known forever. So we always go to the UVA grads first. Um, <laughs> No, but, but this is something that all of you guys brought up that I think is very interesting. So uh, a friend of mine who's the CEO of a company, and this is a company where you work nights and weekends, right? There's some entertainment involved in it. He's a great leader. His employees stay with him for a long time. It's all good. He called me the other day and he said, I'm going to the four-day work week. He said, I, I just, I know I'm not going to be able to keep my people. These are people that are there for three, four, five, six, seven years, like you're talking about it, and he's seeing ahead of time. So I wanted to throw to you guys, and he's a small company. It's not like, oh, it's EY, you've got a billion employees, you'll go to four days, da da da. He's a 10 person company, so I don't, I don't mean to tell it to, to your coworkers here, um, but he's talking about a four day work week. Do you guys see that coming ahead uh, in the future? Anyone? 
Possibly. <laughs> so there are areas that we are exploring within our audit business, specifically I mentioned centralization, and we are trying to centralize some of our very administrative areas within the audit business. And as part of that centralization center, we have sort of a different profile of folks that we're hiring, two-year degrees, um, and it might be an opportunity to do some job sharing, and there might be the opportunity to do four-day work weeks. We are still researching, you know, four-day work weeks. There's some, there's some science around that. There's, I know Japan did a pilot. I've read a couple of articles that there is, um, there, there is something to that. We are trying to understand if that could be right for our business. We're in a client serving business um, and, and how would our clients perceive that, that our people aren't available all on the same day or, or on a given day. So it's on the table. Yeah. It certainly could be interested for businesses where, like you were saying, some people have to be in the office five days a week, some people can work at home, and now you go to a four-day work week and they're like, well, he or she got it, but how come I'm not getting it? I can see some internal issues with that, right? Oh, definitely. We definitely hit that during the pandemic because, like I said, the, the manufacturing folks had to be there on uh, five days a week. So we had to get super creative with what we could offer to them because um, they couldn't be at home. So, I mean, we've done, we, we didn't call it hazard pay because that's a negative connotation, but we did um, special recognition bonuses every couple of months for them. Um, we did go to a four day work week. Um, we did shut down for two weeks and like right when it started in that height where everyone was getting it and we just shut the, we shut all of our facilities down for two to three weeks. Um, so we had to get really creative with what we could do for those employees, um, bringing them in lunches. And I know that that sounds so small, but it's really not. Mm -hmm. It's really not like in the grand scheme of things, they were grateful for it. Mm -hmm. All right, Sarah doesn't know that I'm going to give her a big shout out here, but a big fan of EY for one specific reason, and we've written a, we've written a story on this. Um, you guys have a fabulous autism program, right? We're fabulous, sorry, I didn't hear you. For people on the spectrum who come uh, in. Oh, okay, neurodiversity, yes. Right, so neurodiversity, however you want to describe it. My son is on the spectrum. When I read about it, that's absolutely fantastic. And Tara, you're, you're talking about social good. Talk about the idea of the alternative workforce, right? The Manufacturing Day had a nice program on there the other day talking about neurodiverse people, talking about disabled people, talking about veterans, stuff like that. Are those some of the solutions for the workforce answers of the future that maybe we need to open our eyes to certain different areas that we may not have looked at before? 100%. You know, we have uh, we have a neurodiversity vi division within EY. Um, some of those groups focus specifically on data. It really plays to their skill sets. Uh, there was a piece done through 60 Minutes specifically highlighting EY's uh, neurodiversity program. It's, you know, e we know that people aren't one size fits all and that everybody brings something different to the table. So whether it's veterans, as you mentioned, trying to enter the workforce, we have a recruiting group that focuses on veterans trying to get back into to the workforce and we are you know our neurodiversity program is absolutely thriving and we're really proud of it um, so As you should thank be. you God for bless. mentioning absolutely. that absolutely uh, questions real quick anybody want to jump out this is a great panel from a lot of areas I'm seeing a hand yes sorry I'm in a spotlight yes miss please uh, yeah so we heard a lot about the great resignation so did any of your companies get impacted by that Great resignation. Any companies yeah. get impacted by that in, in a big way? I mean, I, I think, I don't think I, there was a company immune, really. Agreed. I mean, because the, the reality was it was a great resignation, but it, it was also some pretty stiff competition. I mean, the reality is, is that it wasn't that people were just quitting and then, you know, going on sabbaticals, right? They were quitting to move to other competitors, right? They were playing one company off another company. You see this a lot of, you know, in, in inter-industry uh, competition. We saw it acutely with software engineers. We saw it acutely with data scientists, some of the kind of knowledge-based um, uh, positions that we had within the firm at JP Morgan Chase and it was it's it's stiff right um, you know we it took us a little longer than others in the financial services industry to pivot to a hybrid model uh, as a firm-wide policy uh, and the reason why we made that pivot is because the five day a week four day a week in office 
work week was just hurting us from a, from a competitive perspective. And so those that exited the firm really did so to move to other work environments and work situations that better accommodated the lifestyle that they wanted to live. So I don't, I don't think anyone was immune. Yeah, and we're from similar um, sized organizations. We absolutely, across the board, were massively hit by the great resignation. And it was for you know people who we think were being a little bit short-sighted. They were moving for money. They were leaving the culture that we have at EY and we're known for our culture. We're a people culture. We know that we are not a business without our people. We don't make anything. We don't produce anything. We are in a client serving business and our people are our most precious commodity. So we across the board were hit really hard. We are plateauing now though. So we're really happy to see that it's slowed down a bit and uh, retention is, is stabilizing. So I think that's probably uh, you know attributed to the market. Um, kind of stabilizing a little bit in that respect. We're going to wait for the mic. Yes, sir, real quick, what do you got? So we heard earlier uh, from one of the panels that you know we're trying to bring jobs back from a manufacturing standpoint. We need to be productive at that. We have high inflation right now. I agree with bringing more manufacturing back and investing in that. Agree in wanting to have investments in the well-being of our, our team members, our employees. How do you balance that with also competing on the world stage and saying, hey, we need to be extremely productive? Because it is cheaper to make an item somewhere else, put it on a boat, ship it thousands of miles, get it here, and it could be a bicycle, which could then end up costing twice as much if we made it here, or a pharmaceutical item. So there's got to be some type of balance on, we've got to be productive. Um, so, so we are biomedical. Um, so it, we actually, it's human tissue. Um, it's, it's organs, it's bone, um, it's corneas. So we can't ship it. We can't ship it um, overseas. So we're kind of stuck in New Jersey and Pennsylvania and our other facilities. Um, but for us, I think, we need to focus on, um, again, technology. Um, our, when you're in the room in a clean, class t 10 clean room environment and you have to soak something for 10 minutes and it's all manual, like you have to fill out paperwork. If we could get technology into our class 10 clean room environment where um, something has to soak for 10 minutes, you press start, and then at the 10 minutes, a buzzer goes off so you remember to take it out. Because if you don't take it out in 10 minutes or you take it out at eight minutes, then that's a non-conformance for us. So, so our business is very manual right now. Um, and I think that if we can invest in some technology to make that happen quicker and reduce the number of errors, um, that would be, that would that would be great for us. But right now, it's it's very very manual. I think there's also an opportunity to use the moment that we're in, right, with supply chain disruptions that have really created new opportunities uh, to grow business and to really lean into the industry proposition here in in the U.S. I think there's a real opportunity to also use that attention to take more talent off the bench, right? One of the things that um, we have an opportunity to have a line of sight on, you know, being J.P. Morgan Chase, we, we have a lot of clients that are in the manufacturing sector. And in 2019, um, our CEO came out pretty vociferously about the need for more individuals with criminal backgrounds to enter into the world of work, right? To really be given an opportunity to be productive members of society and contributing members of the, our economies. And I'll, I say the number one segment of our client facing our commercial um, customers were manufacturers who want, wanted to talk to us and engage us on what practices we adopted as a financial services industry that's highly regulated that can be adopted in advanced manufacturing as well. And, and we found a tremendous amount of success uh, with our clients, with, our, uh, with our, our, the companies that we work very closely with and advise on, to, on you know, how do you really do that responsibly? How do you really identify and source talent where you know these might be individuals with with you know arrest and conviction backgrounds, but that really present no 
no you know harm to the firm or no no harm to to the work that you're doing so um, I think that's really the real opportunity of right now right are we really taking the talent off the bench and really having that talent build the loyalty with our company so that they sustain and we have that talent long term yes ma'am hi thanks uh, for letting me ask a question. This is for Tara. Um, you had mentioned earlier about a mentoring program. Could you elaborate a little bit more on that? And uh, I think that would be very helpful for us as a small business of one year. No problem, thank you for the question. So I, what I was saying earlier is that we have a small team, so what I find is the bigger companies will have their top leadership mentor uh, their, their junior staff or team members. So the top leadership at my company is Justina right there, <laughs> uh, vice president and myself, and then we have our you know, mid-ish and, and junior level people, but we're small. So what we decided to do as a way to get around that and to still offer the mentoring was to reach out to folks that are in other industries and in really um, senior roles or who are doing really innovative and interesting things that are practitioners of, of our craft as well, but also folks who are in other spaces that we could benefit from. And so I started reaching out to people and at first I, I was trying to figure out what my budget would be. And so the response so far has been overwhelming. People want to actually do this because what we did to make it easier or what we're doing to make it easier on the mentors is we're just asking them to commit to two mentoring sessions because these are super busy people. And then we're just giving each employee multiple mentors. So that way they get the, the support and the advice and the insight and the counsel, but because we're we're identi I've identified, and, and, and Angela, who works with me, has identified some folks who are high level. They don't have a lot of time, but two sessions, asking them to commit to that, it's easy. And then it still is an ongoing program because we have multiple mentors per employee, if that's uh, clear for everyone. I, didn't have, I only had a half a cup of coffee today, so, <laughs> which is actually good for y'all because I'd be bouncing off these chairs. <laughs> Let me close with this because I think it's an important issue. Um, for years, Governor Murphy has talked about, yeah, you pay a little bit more, but you get a little bit more. And often that was talking about the tax issue. And we can talk about the tax issue here all day, but we're not going to go there, but that's okay. <laughs> um, let's talk about something. And, and it's, it's coincidence that we have four, four women up here, but this is not a women's issue. This is a societal issue. You're having a lot of laws being passed on women's health issues, and I'll, I'll put it that way. Um, it, it's, I'm not even going to add my own opinion here, but I know that that's going to impact the workforce going forward on where you're going to place the office, whether someone get out of college says, I will take a job in this state or I won't take a job with that state. Are you guys starting, especially the, the big guys here with EY and Chase, are you starting to see that from people that you're talking to? Do you think that's something in the next five years where people are going to say, what are the rules and regulations of a state and that's going to help me determine jobs? I think so because of the hybrid working, we, and because of the nature of our business, people can be in different, in different states. Um, I'm not, I don't know that we might be impacted by what, you know, what you're referring to. Um, we have tremendous mobility opportunities um, and, and EY recently came out with benefits to support women with those health issues in terms of reimbursement for um, women who, um, are interested in going to another state for uh, to take care of a particular health issue, EY supports that, um, you know, financially for those women um, in terms of their travel. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think for us, it, it, Tara, I think you really hit the nail on the head that there's a value statement that um, our employees are looking for, right? Like our employees are selecting firms are selecting opportunities based on the values that are being modeled by the companies. And so that's why you've seen uh, so many corporations that have come out uh, and made statements on social issues increasingly so. 
uh, over the last few years. And I mean, I know we signed on through the Business Roundtable. There, there was a corporate pledge about you know really uh, pouring in and creating opportunities for for communities and employees and really having a social mission and social purpose to our work. And so I think what combats kind of the political tumult that, that might exist, uh, whatever it ends up being, whatever segment of our population that gets impacted, it's how does the firm then show up to respond to that issue. And I mean, the reality is, is that what, what's gonna end up happening is if it becomes untenable for us to do business in a place, we have to make different business decisions, right? And I think that's really the reality. I mean, our employees, just, just as you said, our employees are our top commodity, right? We, we need our employees to be happy and productive and have the benefits and supports that they need to live their lives fully. Um, and so that falls into our calculus as we're thinking about location strategies, as we're thinking about growth plans, as we're thinking about where we really want to lean in. Right, that's a mic drop moment, so everybody applaud. <laughs> All right, this is gonna be great. We got one more thing. I'm gonna bring John Polomino out here just to wrap things up, but this has been a wonderful day. Thank you guys for sticking around. Thank you for the panelists. This was absolutely super. So John, come on out and close this down. Great job. Great job, thank you very much for being part of this experience for Middlesex County and our businesses. Uh, I just want to take a moment to not only thank this panel, but all the moderators and speakers who participated in today's event. Uh, this is only the beginning of the conversation for us, and hopefully for us collectively, and the network of people you maybe spoke to today, and hopefully the discussions and the dialogue, the experience, and the questions that have been raised here, we now need to do something about that. And we're all at different stages in our experience and our journey. Uh, what we believe collectively is really the, the, the success value that we have to bring together. And what Middlesex County is about is really building those relationships, not just in the private sector, but the governmental sector, because it's critical, because it drives policy, but it also drives the value proposition, both from public, private, academia, all the key elements to the success and the economic growth of Middlesex County. So again, I want to thank all the panelists. Uh, but I just want to take a moment, because behind the scenes to get this all done, uh, you know, I'm surrounded by a tremendous team. Uh, and I just want to recognize them right now uh, for the work they've done to get us here. So first of all, uh, we call them the three-legged stool, but they are the, the, the core of achieving what we've been able to do today and really throughout the year. Starting with uh, Shannon Tambini, who is our director of marketing. Min Kim, who wasn't big and her entire team. Min Kim, who hasn't been, wasn't here today because of uh, uh, medical reasons, but supported by her key team manager, which is uh, uh, Kim uh, Burnett from uh, the Office of Communications. John Carroll and his team. He's the Director of Public and Government Affairs. Um, those three offices really put this together in a way that hopefully brings value to all of us that have participated. Um, and two other key players in really bringing this together, and the offices I just mentioned are relatively new for the county over the last couple of years. Uh, the newest is the Office of Business Engagement, led by Sandy Casta and the job she's done here, so Sandy. <laughs> and we talked about it all day long, Things don't happen without technology, right? So Silvio Castellucci, he's our director of, uh, he's our CIO uh, for technology. <laughs> and all the folks behind the scenes running the videos, the mics and everything else. Again, I'm proud of the team that we've built. And I think we all know that we're only as good as the people we surround ourselves with and the talent that we have. So <clears throat> I want to recognize them for that. I want to thank them for that. And again, we hope that we left you with something that adds value to how we move forward in the business that you, you're involved with and engage with. So again, thank you all on behalf of the Board of Commissioners of Middlesex County. We thank you for your time and we thank you for your participation. So everybody have a great day and be safe.